have Michael Fox. Um, Michael has taught dozens and dozens of OLLI courses and focused on the documentary genre. Michael is an internationally respected journalist and critic, um, and many believe, myself included, that he has upheld the ethics of the documentary genre. I also regard him as one of the pillars that makes San Francisco Bay Area home to documentary filmmaking. He has contributed to all of our literacy around how documentary films speak. Michael Fox, The Great Documentaries. Susan, thank you. That's, that's way too much praise. I am, uh, as Harry alluded, one of those not so smart college boys who breaks everything down, although I never took a film class in college, so maybe I'm giving myself way too much credit. Uh, with that, good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well and staying well. Uh, most of my classes over the years have focused on new or very recent documentaries, either through the Bay Area Documentary Filmmakers classes or Global Lens. And I have done some historical documentary classes, which is what this one is. So uh, you may be aware that the very first film ever exposed was nonfiction. The first cameras were taken out in the street by the Lumiere brothers or Edison built a shed for his huge heavy camera and brought performers in. But essentially what they shot was nonfiction. And for a certain amount of time, that not only was the, the paramount entertainment vehicle for the public, but also pioneered various filmmaking techniques. And there was a point, let's say mid-century, when documentaries were left behind, partly or largely because of the technology. They didn't have synchronized sound and the cameras were heavy. So even if they went to war in the 40s, someone had to write and read a narration over the footage. It wasn't until the 60s, really, when filmmakers could take cameras out into the field and shoot on the fly and record sound on the fly. And that's where this class is gonna begin, is in the mid 60s, after the American documentary is somewhat codified or fossilized, if you will, into educational films. Uh, obviously, the arrival of public television in the 50s comes into play here, but I don't want to put down public TV films, especially in the early years of public TV when there was a lot of innovation. So what we're going to look at here are eight films that you'll look at outside of class and before class, and I'll send you a letter each week with links to all sorts of reading material about these films, because much has been written about them. And then I'll give a, a short lecture, depending on your definition of short, and then we'll open up the conversation to discussion. We may also have breakout rooms where uh, eight to 10 of you, let's say, will have a few minutes. Well, all of you, but in groups of eight to 10, will have a few minutes to discuss the films. And uh, part of what I want to <clears throat> do here is consider why some of these films are influential, how they open new roads for documentary. Some, let's say like Orson Welles' F for Fake, which may be perhaps the least known film on this list, you may, might not have known that Orson Welles made a documentary, is so unique, so one of a kind, that I don't know that it could be influential. Uh, but it's rarely seen, and it's a, it's a work of wonderful illusion and magic. You may know that Welles adored magic. So it's a film that stands alone. Uh, to, to go back to the top of the list, we're going to start with Frederick Weisman's very first film, a great example of brutal expose, Titicut Follies, which he shot in a hospital for the criminally insane in Massachusetts, and is uh, both a cutting edge film in terms of setting a standard for future documentaries, and is also controversial, was banned, it couldn't be shown for many years. And then we'll go to D.A. Pennebaker's tour of England with Bob Dylan in the mid 60s. The murder of Fred Hampton, which is a, another brutal scathing film about the Black Panther leader who was killed in Chicago. Wells' is F for Faye. The Maisels Brothers, controversial and beloved Grey Gardens. Perhaps the only documentary to spawn a Broadway show. I'll have to actually research that and see if that's actually true. And then Barbara Koppel's 
to my mind, greatest film, her Oscar-winning portrait of a labor strike, Harlan County, USA. Now, the other two films, One We Were Kings, which is about the Ali Frazier flight in, fight in Zaire, and Agnes Varda's Wonderful, The Gleaners and I, are both terrific films, but I'm leaning possibly towards swapping them out, because as you'll see, there's no Errol Morris film or Werner Herzog film in our list. And I think uh, among influential contemporary filmmakers, they should be included. So again, you're gonna look at the films ahead of time outside of class. I'll give you ample reading material, both of that period when the films came out and more contemporary. And then we'll talk about how these films stand up, what makes them so important, in what ways have they been emulated, copied, uh, paid homage to, ripped off, in which ways are they beyond homage, and uh, in so doing, we'll see how documentary filmmakers rescued documentary for the masses in a way, to make them popular entertainment, and I mean that in the best possible sense, as opposed to just didactic scholarship. So I hope to see you on Tuesdays beginning January 19th. Thank you.